Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. We would like to show you one of the different techniques possible to transfer data from the patient on an articulator. Attempts have been made and will be made in the future to facilitate the dentist's task to help the patient in disturbances of the masticatory system. Here we present the registration technique and its rationale which is in use in many schools all over Europe and in some schools in the States too. A combined FACEBO stylus registration technique based on Alfred Giese's work was developed by Albert Gerber and is being used at the Dental Institute at the University of Zurich. The combined FACEBO stylus registration technique has been found valuable in prosthodontic treatment and in occlusal analysis. It has been improved in everyday practice as a method that furnishes precise data. It is easy to work with and it can therefore be accepted as a highly rationalized way to comprehensive dentistry. The transfer of data from the patient on an articulator provides the opportunity to study on mounted casts the functional relation of antagonistic teeth even from an intraoral site in a more precise and detailed view. Prostodontic reconstruction built in an articulator adjusted to the patient's data afford a harmonious function with a minimum necessity of adjustment of the insertion of the reconstruction in the patient's mouth. The purpose of the combined face bow stylus registration technique are one, to determine centric jaw relation, two, to trace and measure the condylar path in protrusive movement, and three, to mount the stone cast in a proper relationship on an articulator. Point one, centric relation as we define it is the position of the mandible to the maxilla characterized by a centered position of the condyle in his fossae, that is the uppermost and midmost position of the condyles in their glenoid fossa without compression or distraction of the surrounding structures. To determine centric relation as just defined, the intraoral gothic arch tracing has proven to be a reliable and relatively simple procedure. The apex of the gothic arch represents, under normal physiologic conditions, a reproducible border position of the mandible from which lateral movements can be made. The tripod arrangement of the intraoral registration device here mounted on an edendulous patient guides the mandible almost automatically into the centric relation. One pod is the centric bearing pin, the two other pods are the condyles, as shown in this figure. Since neurophysiological investigations hint at the fact that there are many horizontal positions which the mandible can assume within normal functional range, a tolerable occlusion is rather indicated than a pinpoint one. This freedom of movement in centric, in harmony with the temporomandibular joint in the neuromuscular system, avoids undue stress upon supporting tissue rather than an occlusal confined to strictly guided path. Point two. The condylar path for protrusive movements of the mandible can be registered easily, quickly, and precisely without distortion. It can be measured 
in degrees as related to the plane of occlusion. Point three, the face bow transfer allows a correct mounting of the casts on an articulator, relating the mandibular cast to the transverse axis of the articulator, which can represent the arbitrary or true hinge axis of the patient. This procedure provides all essential information that can be gained from a study of mounted casts or that is needed for reconstruction. First of all, some details on the face bow. It may be called a kinematic face bow because it moves with the lower jaw. It serves two purposes. One, for the transfer of the relation of the plane of occlusion to the temporomandibular joints, whether you use an arbitrary or the true hinge axis, which can be located with this face bow. Two, it is used to trace the sagittal condylar path. The general parts are the face bow, the transfer plate, and the face bow support. The face bow has a crossbar with two friction grips to mount the transfer plate. and a stud to mount the face bow with a clamp to the face bow support. The face bow has two telescoping side arms which can be adjusted in three ways. and fixed with a set screw, one way, second way, and the third way. Each sidearm has at its distal end a spring-loaded stylus, which bears a graphite pin to trace the sagittal path of the condyle. This stylus is also adjustable. Now some details on Gerber's condylator. It is a semi-adjustable articulator. The intercondylar distance is a set fixed 108 millimeter with closed locks, a simple hinge movement or barn door movement results. The condylar guidance for protrusive movement can be set at any individual degree from zero to 60 degrees or even more. I open the locks. The protrusive condylar path is not the straight line, but starts at zero degree and becomes increasingly steeper and leads into the inclination set individually according to the findings on the patient. The condyle moves at its very beginning on a curved path and comes right up as the mandible goes forward and backward again and forward again and back into centriculation. Let's have a look at the skull for protrusive forward and back and forward and back. If for any reason the condyle should be forced further backward, for instance, when you bend your head backward, the condyle doesn't stay any longer in this centric position, 
that is forced back and down again. This is the retrusive path we also can make on the condylator. First, let's have a look on this graph. From centric relation, the cone dial moves backward and downward and comes to centric relation and goes backward and downward and comes up to centric relation again. On the articulator, I have to release the lock and make the same movement from centric relation back and down and up again in centric relation and from centric relation back and down and up again in centric relation. You must not be disturbed by the, mo the moment that on the condylator all movements are upside down because on the articulator it's not the mandible that moves but the upper part. However, there is no change in the relative position of the two parts against each other since it is a closed mechanical system. The Bennett movement is guided by a B-cone element that is set at about 12 degree for working and 18 degree for balancing. Therefore, the idling cone dial goes forward and midward and downward on an 18 degree slope, whereas the working condyle goes forward, sideward and downward on a 12 degree incline. Note that here again, there is no sharp line separating the two cones, but rather a smooth continuity from balancing to the working side. On the skull here, you see, if you work on the right side, you on the right side, you have this movement with a 12 degree working and the 18 degree balancing. If you chew on the left side, you have 12 degree working, the 18 degree balancing. And if you go to chew on the left side, you have 12 degree working and 18 degree balancing. But you note on the articulator, the upper part moves, lateral working 12 degree and lateral balancing 18 degree. And if you chew on the left side, you have again lateral working 12 degree and lateral balancing 18 degree. On the condylator, this guidance takes place in all combined movements of the mandible. Thus, the supporting cusp playing around in centric creates a dimple working area in an antagonistic surface. Consequently, it works like a pestle in a mortar. This can be observed in well-grounded, good-functioning natural dentitions, as shown in this frontal section through the second molars of stone casts of a middle-aged person. Now, let's go to the patient. This is my wife Monica and now my patient. For this presentation I have already prepared two registration plates. A lower registration plate as shown here. It is made out of former tray. It's very easy to make it. And an upper one with a central bearing pin. Note 
that the lingual cusps of the maxillary teeth, the premolars and the molars, are kept by the registration plate in order not to displace mobile teeth by pressure on the registration pin. Now, on the patient, I first locate the condyles. When Monica opens her mouth, you notice a little dimple just in front of the tragus of the ear. That's where the condyle is placed directly under the skin when she closes her mouth. I mark this place with an indelible pencil or with a felt tip pen. Close, please. If you want to locate the condyle, you can do it very easily by placing the fingertips of three fingers of each hand over this area. So you can feel the smoothness of the condylar movement or irregularity if present, for instance, caused by uncoordinated muscle action or clicking noise or crepitation caused by roughness of the articulating surfaces. I have to mark the other side too. Open please and close. There we are. You may locate the arbitrary hinge X by using a flexible ruler. Would you please take off your glasses? You place the ruler from the tragus of the ear to the outer canthus of the eye and 13 millimeters in front of the tragus you got the location for your condyle. It's approximately the same place where I put my mark. Now to measure the condylar path I need the transfer plate which corresponds to the bite fork you use, but as our face bow is mounted on the lower arch, we can also trace the condylar path with it. To fix the transfer plate, I place a piece of impression compound on the lower each border. Like this. And on the other side too, a little bit more. What we want here is just the impression of the cusp tips of the lower teeth. I have to warm thoroughly the impression compound, but make sure that the whole thing is not too hot in order not to burn the patient. That my work. I hold it firmly and then I cool it off with a spray. That's fine. Hold this place. And remove the transfer plate with a quick movement and cool it in ice water. I take off these little bulbs here and replace the transfer plate in Monica's mouth. It fits Now I need the upper registration plate with the central bearing pin, which is placed in the maxillary arch like this, and the transfer plate in the lower arch like this. Close, please. And now I have to make sure that there is no tooth contact in lateral and protrusive movement. Yes, and also I have to make sure that the opening is at the minimum. Open, please. I can adjust this with the stylus. 
it's always free open a little bit we can close more and there we are is the movement free still I mount the face bow on the transfer plate note that the side arms are in a perpendicular position in order not to injure the patient's eye and I adjust the side arm in a way that the stylus with the graphite point points on the mark I placed over the skin lateral to the condyle and I fix the set screw like this now you may if you wish locate the hinge axe as you do with a hinge axe locator I place a millimeter ruled card over this area under the stylus and fix the card firmly against the temporal bone I loosen the stylus and now the patient makes opening movement and close and open and close and you note that I'm not far away from what is considered to be the hinge axis now I have to adjust the card so that the horizontal lines are in parallel to the reference rod here which in turn is parallel to the transfer plate and this one is parallel to the occlusion uh, the plane of occlusion now please move your mandible forward without opening yes and back again that's fine and another time again I make sure that these lines are parallel and forward and back again and another time again adjust and back again and the fourth time there we are forward and backward I repeat the same procedure on the left side what I got is now the tracing of the protrusive condyle path of the sagittal path of the condyle in protrusive movement. Now I take the face bow away, make sure that the screws are tightened so the face bow has a sure position, it's easy to transfer the mandibular position to the condyle into the articulator. Now the patient may relax for a little moment and I prepare now the registration plate, the lower one, with the upper one. Before I get some color on the registration plate I have to ascertain first that the dimension I had is appropriate also for this too. Just movement free. I lower the pin. Not yet. A little bit more. Now the patient may move in all directions he chooses or her cho she chooses. This relaxes the muscles and gives the patient the feeling of the freedom of the mandible she has. Is it easy to do? Well then, I take the lower plate out and color it with a crayon. You may also use a felt tip pen. I prefer the crayon. It's a thin layer of color on it now. I give the plate back in the patient's mouth. Close, please. And now make the following movements forward and backward and forward and backward. 
And as you are back, now go to the right and back and forward and back. And as you are back, go to the left and back and forward and back and to the right and back. The operator should refrain from touching the patient's chin. He may coach the movement, but he should not force the mandible in any strained position. Again, forward, backward, to the right and back, and forward, backward, and to the left, and back. Now open, please. What we get is a gothic arch tracing or a geezy arrow point and the arrow point indicates the retruded position of the mandible, the position of the mandible from where lateral movements can be made. It coincides with the uppermost and midmost position of the condyles of both sides. This one is the fore and back movement and this one is the movement to the left side and the movement to the right side. Now I fix this situation or to counter check it I cross I mark a cross here over the arrow point. I scratch it with a sharp instrument. And there we are. And recolor the plate. I still can see the hair cross. Replace plate in the patient's mouth. Close, please. And again, forward and back. And to the right and back. Forward and back. And to the left and back. So these movements are repeated. And open, please. We get the same arrow point as before. As you can see here, and you will always get the same arrow point, not throughout lifetime, but for this period you need for reconstruction. Nothing is constant in life. Now, let me take out the upper plate and fix this arrow point with a plexiglass disc. This plexiglass disc has a perforation, as you notice here, and I place it in such a way over the arrow point that the little hole in the plexiglass disc is just above the arrow point. This is fixed with sticky wax. There we are. You see that I assured the situation for the plexiglass disc by putting the wax throughout to the border of the registration plate because here we have our crayon color which is a little bit fatty and isolates too much. Now I replace the plate in Monica's mouth and put the bearing stylus and the maxilla. Oh, there we are, and close. And she closes right into the little hole. I fix the position of the mandible towards the maxilla with a creamy mix of white impression plaster. The plaster is now in processing. Please. Let me insert the popsicle stick. And popsicle sticks are very appropriate to do this. They are small and handy. Thank you. Inside. 
two. That's it. And we let the plaster set. Now the plaster's okay. I take this tray, please open the mouth, and I remove all from the patient's mouth. There we are. And make sure that I have everything. I got the two keys. I got the face bow for the transfer and I got the condor path. That's all I need for the moment from the patient. The central bearing pin and the registration plate. I need another time if I want to make sure the position of the condyles in their fossa by ranconography in the position we keyed the mandible to the maxilla. Now we are ready to get, go back to the lab. In the lab I have first to cut away with a sharp knife all undercut areas on the transfer plate and also the areas where the impression compound may have displaced soft tissue in the patient's mouth. Now the cast should fit well on the transfer plate. As you see, this can be secured with a little wax on both sides. And now we place it back to the face bow and place the whole thing into the articulator. Now, in this situation, the reference rod should be parallel to the lower member of the articulator. This is secured by this clamp here. It's only adjustable in the height and in this direction. The reference rod always stays parallel. The stylus with the graphite pin should point to the axis of the articulator. This is adjusted only by varying the height on the clamp. Can place the two styli into the axis. There we are. No strain position and fix it. Now the cast is mounted with a creamy mix of impression plaster just before you have to soak the base of the cast in water. There we are, the mounting is already done. I can take the face bow away. And I take the transfer plate away. And now I have to mount the upper cast to the lower cast by means of the plaster keys. But here again, before I have to remove all contact areas with soft tissue, and also the areas of undercuts. I do this again with a sharp knife. What I need here again are the cusp tips. I see the knife is very sharp. The cusp tips are left here. I can place this over the cast as you see here and mount the upper with 
the same precision as we did before. I prepare now also the other part. Oop, it's broken. First the sharp knife and now this. But you see, as it is plaster, you can replace the pieces very exact and sharp. It doesn't matter. And I place the upper cast into the key, as you see here. And now we have the same situation in the articulator as we had in the patient's mouth. To mount the upper cast, I have to raise the upper plate of the condolator for the amount of separating we had through the registration device. And I have to make sure that the condylar axis is fixed like this. And you noticed already that there are some edges cut out of the upper cast to mount it in the split cast technique. The split cast technique in Zurich is not used as it is the original purpose to control the centric relation wax bites, but to facilitate the occlusal analysis. Furthermore, you can use it as a control for the proper work of your technician. If he cheated by mounting the cast, it's very easily by the split cast technique to control the whole mounting. There we are. I open the articulator, take the keys away. They don't go by themselves. I raise the incisal pin and close again. But you notice here it's impossible to close quite into occlusal contact because there must be some prematurity somewhere and how much this is I don't tell yet where it is. I open and you see the upper cast falls back into centric occlusion and if I close, you get a little gap between the cast and the mounting part for the cast. And this difference is the difference you have between centric occlusion, the cast is in, and centriculation, where the cast was mounted in. That is centriculation. You have somewhere some prematurity. There's no gap in the split cast. And I let the cast drop in centric occlusion. There's the gap, the difference. Now, where's the prematurity? I'll show you. You see this classical spot? I hold the cast against the split cast. And there you can see it. Come very close. I'll try to turn. There we are. Third molar extruded, makes contact with the second lower molar on this side, and there goes the cast into centric occlusion. To finish the work in the lab, I have to measure the angulation of the condylar path towards the occlusal plane. You see here the drawings we got from the patient. I'm interested in the very first part of this sinusoid shaped curve because that's where the condyle has to work when the tooth, the teeth work together. So I now draw a tangent line to the initial part of the condylar path. 
and measure it in degrees compared to the occlusal plane, which we said was parallel to the horizontal line of this registration card. And I get here about 48 degrees. I do this for all the readings I had and do it also for the other side. Now, these 48 degrees for the right side are not quite correct because on the patient this means that we had 48 degrees for the occlusal plane against the condylar path. But as we registered the condylar path, we had to open the patient's mouth a little bit because of the registration device. Now, as we open the mouth, these two pointers become more parallel. As more as you open, the more parallel they become. So the angle becomes more acute. It's to say the reading is a little bit too small. The angle is a little bit too small, so we have to have a correction. And for the distance we get in this angulation, from here to here in this triangle, we can make this factor, it has been calculated, for one millimeter of opening, you have to add a half degree. So for Monica's reading, we have to add three degrees because the opening while we did the registration was six millimeters. I add these three degrees and get here 51 degree for the right side and 50 plus 3, 53 degree for the left side. These readings I adjust on the articulator. We said left side, 53 degree. There we are. And for the right side, we said 51 degree. There we are. Now, all is set for the occlusal analysis, but I don't want to go into further details of the occlusal analysis. I rather have to explain some readings of the Gothic arch tracings and some readings of temporomandibular röntgenographs. In this x-ray, you notice that the gap between the top of the condyle and the bottom of the fossa is rather large. The patient has closed in maximum intercuspation, it's to say, in centric occlusion. Now, with the central registration device in C2, you see that the condyle entered the fossa and is now centered. The pictures are taken in this standardized method so we are not fooled by angulation of the Röntgen beam. In this situation, we had the condyle in the centered position, in the midmost and uppermost, and the very apex of the Gothic arch is this centric relation position. This is a normal Gothic arch tracing. And this is a normal tracing too. The patient has the possibility to get his mandible earlier in lateral movements than in the first one that is superimposed. You notice the arrow points coincide. This tracing instead shows no definite arrow point. It's rather a shallow curve. And you see that the arrow point of the normal reading is far behind of this, so it indicates that the patient made all his movement in a more mesial situation than in centric relation position of the mandible. Now this airplane here shows quite the contrary. The patient is able to go further back than centric relation, as you show in comparison with the normal tracing. But you see, it's not possible to make lateral movements from the real most retruded position. So for this, the patient has to come a little bit more mesial and then he is in CR and from there he can start uh, lateral movements. 
But when the patient is in tension and the muscles are tense, then he is not able to make nice tracing as we had it for the normal case. The whole tracing is restricted, but the arrow point still is, in this case, in CR. And here we have another abnormal situation. It's to say the patient is not able to get his mandible to the left. So there is some hindrance in the right condylar area or in the right muscular area. In this case, we have the disturbance in the left condylar area because the condyle goes farther back on the left side than on the right side, as you can compare it with the normal tracing. I showed you some tracings of the Gothic arch and told you how to interpret them. Note that the very nice Gothic arch may be produced by a patient whose lateral pterygoid muscles on both sides are under tension and therefore fix the condyles anterior against the articular tubercles. Thus, the arrow point does not indicate centric, but the protruded jaw relation. As we have everything assembled together, the history and the analysis, the examination and the x-rays, we could proceed with the occlusal analysis or with a reconstruction. This rather simple combined face bow central bearing point registration technique here in a setup for complete denture construction was designed one to determine centric jaw relation, two to trace and measure the condylar path in protrusive movements and three to transfer the data on an articulator. The condylator as a semi-adjustable articulator in turn is built to accept these data and to reproduce mandible movements with the idea to create a tolerable occlusion in harmony with the temporomandibular joints and the neuromuscular system. No registration technique whatever will give us dependable results unless we are able to interpret the readings based upon our knowledge and experience. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.